Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my basement. Uh, uh, I'm uh, as Nadika uh, introduced me. I'm uh, Shubha Das, uh, Shubha Ranjan Das, uh, which a lot of people can't pronounce. So I, I just go by Das. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, chemistry in the kitchen. And uh, first, before that, uh, just uh, I'll have my slides here. Hopefully, the resolution, everything is is fine. Um, just by way of acknowledgments, in case I run long and uh, uh, forget and things like that. I just want to thank Nadika and Zainab, uh, as well as Musharraf and Amok for all the setup and things and for the invitation uh, for this uh, presentation to the Kilter Club. Uh, and also for Chris Ashok for uh, uh, prodding me along uh, uh, into this. Uh, I'm not a food scientist. Uh, I am a associate professor of chemistry uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and uh, my lab does uh, research at the Mellon Institute. Uh, this building might look familiar, uh, depending on if you've seen this movie. Uh, it's a, uh, maybe a while back, this Batman movie was filmed in this building. Um, but my lab, we work in chemistry and biology interface. Um, mainly, we make modified DNA and RNA for biochemistry. But as we were doing this, the kinds of molecules we use in our lab uh, you know, uh, here's an example for, not from our paper, but uh, some others, but there's cholesterol, there's uh, adenosine, which is similar to guanosine, uh, which is related to umami and, and taste molecules. There's ribose, which is a sugar, which is in DNA and RNA. And the forces that keep these things together are essentially the same forces that we encounter in everyday life, which is why chemistry is fascinating to me. Uh, and so a number of years ago, uh, I don't want to say how long, uh, you know, before I had gray hair, I suppose. Uh, I started a course to try and teach chemistry uh, using food and food molecules. Uh, and so uh, the way that's set up is rather than think about food in terms of the basic food groups, uh, where you have dairy or, you know, meat and proteins and poultry and vegetables and so on, uh, I wanted to uh, get students to think about the important food molecule groups. Right, so water, fats, carbohydrates, proteins, uh, aroma and flavor molecules. In, in a sense, this essentially covers the list of molecules that we deal with in, in, in lab. Uh, so today I'm gonna uh, just focus a little bit uh, on some of those things. Mostly I'll talk about water because uh, that's sort of the, you know, one of the most basic molecules and the most important uh, when it comes to life, frankly. Um, and so, uh, let me start off, and I'll maybe, you know, go a little bit into fats, uh, uh, because then we can do some fun things as well. So, uh, the reason I want to talk to you about water uh, is because there's so many uh, fascinating things that, you know, once you understand these basic, you know, chemistry, chemical concepts, then I want you to be able to use that in a way that's... Uh, sort of useful for you, generally speaking, so that you can essentially, the, the, the point of science is to, to improve uh, how, you, how you do things. Uh, so, if you think about water, it's a simple molecule. Uh, it has an oxygen and two hydrogens, and because of that, because it's slightly bent, the oxygen is more electronegative. The electrons are closer to oxygen. So it acts like a small dipole, like a tiny magnet. There's a positive uh, part and a negative part, the negative part being the oxygen. Um, and so rather than going into too much detail of that, let me just uh, talk to you about microwaves because microwaves are extremely efficient uh, and useful uh, in heating uh, water. And so uh, let me just, quickly ask you about microwaves, right? So um, so this is sort of the electromagnetic spectrum and you can see, you know, microwaves are somewhere here, right? So um, uh, question for you, uh, how many, uh, so I think uh, we have a few questions in the poll, maybe Narika can launch that. Uh, you know, I think I see it there. Do you have a microwave? Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, and if you use it regularly or if you don't use it, I'm just wondering. So 
So I think there's a large number of people who uh, do have and use microwaves. All right, great. Uh, so that brings me to my next question. Do you know how a microwave oven works? All right, so a lot of people have uh, uh, some idea, so not as many as have microwaves. Seems like that. All right, so that gets me to my next question. A slightly, uh, slightly different. So the next question is, have you seen a microwave? So I'm not asking about a microwave oven. I'm asking, have you seen a microwave? So, so this is a microwave, a microwave oven. So have you seen a microwave itself? Uh, maybe you're wondering what's going on. How can you see a microwave? No. And the, the answer is you, you can't really see a microwave, right? A microwave uh, is, is in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's not in the visible spectrum, right? So you can't really see a microwave. Um, but in science, what we do is we use reporter molecules or other ways to detect things, right? So let's see if we can detect a microwave, right? And so for that, uh, let's uh, try and put a bulb in the microwave. Right. So my next question to you uh, is, have you ever put a bulb in a microwave? So I, I've just zoomed into the microwave so that you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to just step away from this. And open this up. Oh, there's a bulb inside already. How nice. So, uh, in order, so the reason I'm doing this is to try and figure out how a microwave works. So, uh, let's just observe what happens when you put a microwave. So, the, the, so this, uh, what you see here and in, in, in the microwave is an incandescent bulb, right? It's, uh, you know, you don't use a, uh, you know, a C CFL, don't use a CFL. Or uh, LED bulb, those don't work. These are the you know incandescent bulbs. These are harder to get these days. I understand. Uh, also, uh, don't do this at home. Uh, I don't know how old the, all the viewers are. Don't do this at home uh, unless you have an adult. Uh, uh, I sh should say responsible adult. Uh, you know who's who's guiding you. Uh, but the the or you can just watch and because uh, I'm doing this, so you don't necessarily have to. But you can see what's going on. Uh, so, what happens? Let's put the bulb in the you know center, or you know. Well, let's put the bulb off to one side, okay? Uh, and oops, so the the um, one quick uh, I, uh, thing I want to just point out, uh, which is why I do this uh, course it, to teach uh, uh, you know chemistry and and get uh, uh, students interested in science is I want them to be able to work in the lab and then the kitchen is not very different. So the first and the most important thing about working in the lab or in a kitchen or frankly anything is what? Uh, that's not a poll question. I'll, I'll give you the answer. The answer is safety. You always want to make sure you do things in a safe way. Okay. So all right. So uh, right now you're, you're not right directly in front of me uh, or, or here. So, uh, the, you know, the, you don't have to worry about stepping back. Others I, I would have asked you to step back. So I'm going to put this on. Uh, now this is a how many watt bulb? Oh, this is a 50 watt bulb, and this is a 700 watt oven. I think you can see that, right? Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to put it for too long. I'm just going to do it for uh, 11 seconds or let. You can be a little bit more brave. I'll do it for about, let's say, whoops.
let's try it for 20 seconds and let's see what happens and so what happens is uh, when the microwaves hit the bulb uh, the, the, the job of the filament inside is to glow when there's electrons moving around so when the the, the microwaves are incident on this uh, it's sort of a uh, you know a circuit in there and pushes the electrons and they go through the filament and the filament glows and so you know there's microwaves are incident so here's a question for you um, you know was the bulb glowing at all times and the answer is no right because um, you know you, you could see it went on and off and that's because you know as it was rotating there are spots where the microwave uh, is uh, are incident and spots where, there, where the microwaves are not incident and that's why you have that turntable so it averages out where the, the food you know the microwaves hit the whatever it is you put inside uh, mostly food uh, so the next question is in terms of using the microwave uh, what happens when you put the microwave at a low power right so you have all of these different buttons and settings right you have a time uh, and then you have uh, a power setting. So, what happens when you have a you know low power setting, and why do you have the low power setting, right? Uh, so, to answer that, uh, you know, just let's let's look at uh, let's try this. And and so, you know, one of one of the ways you can think about it is well, energy is related to wavelength and frequency. So, if you have if you want lower power, then you change the you know the, the the frequency and so on, uh, but frankly, the, the you know this this, this tiny device or you know, this small box that you buy uh, is not that sophisticated to do all that frequency modulation and so on, right? A microwave typically operates at twenty four fifty megahertz, um, and, and that's more or less fixed. Uh, so the the way the power works is, uh, and I'll come to that. So let's see what happens. Uh, you know, if we say, well, when you change the power level, instead of changing uh, the frequency, what we can do is maybe give the same amount of, you know, give less energy, but do it by reducing the time that we uh, radiate or put the microwaves in. So I'm going to put it in the center, right, where it should be, you know, more or less focused, you know, all the time. And again, just a shield in case it, it shatters. And now I'm going to put time cook 20 seconds. Now it's in the center, right? So it should be focused more, you know, all the time um, at, say, 50%, right? So what does that 50% power mean? 50% does it mean that you know it's going to have the frequency is going to be different or it's only you know and it should be only half the energy uh, but the way that works and let's if I hit start let me start and you can see it's still growing but then it you know goes off Yeah, sometimes you'll see uh, these these other glows and so on because typically these bulbs are filled with a, an inert gas so that the filament itself inside doesn't oxidize. Uh, but one thing you would have noticed that the brightest it glowed now was as bright as when is it was at full power, correct? Okay, so uh, that means you haven't really reduced the you know sort of energy of the microwaves itself going in. But by putting at 50% power, what happens is the microwave is only uh, on, uh, or the, it's only emitting microwaves 50% of the time, right? And that's how you get 50% power. Now, so why do we want to do that, right? Uh, so, uh, let me just put this away. I'm going to just move this away. 
So, so why, why do we want to do that? Uh, so the, the reason for doing that, as I mentioned, is a microwave operates at 2450 megahertz, which, you know, or 2.45 gigahertz. Um, and so one, when that happens, as I mentioned to you, the uh, water molecule uh, is a polar molecule, which means it's a, it has a, has a dipole, which means it acts like a small magnet. And the thing about microwaves is this, uh, they are essentially very similar to the, the rotational frequency of that, you know, bond between oxygen and hydrogen. And so what happens is that molecule starts spinning at that, you know, with those frequencies. And that actually generates a lot of heat. And that's where you get that heat. So the microwave is extremely efficient at um, heating water. Okay, more efficient, say, than boiling it on your stovetop and so on, which is why a microwave is a very useful device, but you need, have to know how to use it and what it's useful for. So the thing is it's water. Um, and so another thing I just want to point out, uh, the thing about water is water has a very high boiling point. And why does it have such a high boiling point? Is because of something called hydrogen bonding, right? And, you know, there's all these different kinds of bonds, but hydrogen bonds, they're not really... Uh, you know, things attached, like, you know, you have the bond between oxygen and hydrogen. That's uh, where, you know, you have something directly attaching those two molecules, which are the electrons in between. A hydrogen bonding is something a little bit more nebulous, and students sometimes have a hard time understanding that, because these are very weak interactions. But when you have lots of these weak interactions, they're actually pretty strong, right? Uh, in fact, it's the same hydrogen bonding interactions that keeps your DNA in a, you know, duplex together. Right. Um, so one interesting thing about water molecules, when you put a lot of them together, uh, for example, in, in liquid water, water has such a high boiling point. Why? Because compared to, say, alcohol, in which it has only one uh, OH and the other hydrogen is replaced by something. So you have, much, you know, f fewer hydrogen bonds, you know, uh, much. So alcohol boils much faster because you don't have as many interactions that you need to give energy to uh, to, to uh, get it to boil. Now, one interesting thing about hydrogen bonds, you can't really see hydrogen bonds, but the, the reason I start talking about microwaves and water is because the microwave, to my knowledge, is one of the, the best ways to actually see this uh, effect of hydrogen bonds uh, in, in action. Because when you have water and you solidify it in, and have it as ice, ice will not heat up in a microwave, right? And why is that? See, remember I told you when you have a water molecule, uh, microwaves are incident on it and it starts spinning around? Well, when you have ice, uh, the, there's hydrogen bonding between the, uh, the molecules. And, and so these are all kept together. Uh, and so when the microwaves are incident, then those hydrogen bonds just keep them in place and they can't really spin around at those microwaves frequency. And as a result, uh, a microwave will not heat ice, but water will boil. So I hope that's some useful information to you because if you take something straight out of the freezer, then, um, let me see. Oops, I just, sorry, excuse me. Uh, if you uh, if you take uh, ice or um, or something straight from the freezer and put it in the microwave, it's not going to heat up very efficiently, right? Uh, so you want to put some liquid. Um, sorry. Oops. Okay. Uh, so you want to put some liquid water uh, on whatever it is you have, so that it, it will heat up. Um, so in fact, you can try this fun thing. You can make cups that are made of ice, or just take a, a equal volume of ice and you know in one cup and water in another cup and put it in a microwave. And you know, um, as long as you know the surface of the ice is more or less dry, um, you, you know you, you will see that the ice ice will not heat up, but the water will start boiling. And you can use this information uh, pretty usefully. For example, if you have you know old you know fried rice or something rice in the fridge or some other thing if you sprinkle a little bit of water that helps it heat up more efficiently uh, and coming back to uh, coming back to you know why do you have low power um, 
you have uh, other power settings uh, because uh, you want the that additional time when it goes off for the the heat to spread from the water to the other things uh, another fun fact since we're talking about you know bonds and polar bonds is if you have a molecule like carbon dioxide now carbon dioxide unlike water it's not bent it's a, it's a linear molecule so it's a non-polar molecule which means uh, it's not going to be be heated up in a microwave in fact the microwave is the only uh, real way i know that you can make a warm and fizzy drink right because if you take you know coke or a soda or whatever uh, on a stovetop then uh, and, and you heat it up you'll get bubbles and nucleation and you'll lose fizz of course you know at a higher temperatures the, the you're going to have less uh, carbon dioxide be soluble in that liquid but still you know uh, a microwave warms fizzy drink is you know microwave is a, is a way to make that i'm not saying it tastes good okay well you can find that out but uh, that's the only way I know that you can make a warm fizzy drink. Anyway, so so the re as we, as I mentioned, microwaves are very efficient for heating polar molecules. Uh, the water heats up almost immediately. Um, but uh, the other uh, mode of con uh, of heat transfer is conduction, and you need time for this transfer because it's basically molecules you know are transferred to the molecule that's next to it and so on so that's why dense materials like metals and so on um, you know uh, they uh, conduct very well whereas wood and plastic in which uh, which are less dense and the molecules are not so closely packed together uh, those are, are less conductive right uh, and so when you have a, a, a piece of food uh, which has water in some spots but other spots are like fat or other things uh, uh, you know more dense material then you need time for that transfer to take place right uh, uh, convection is not really in operation unless you have you know th that's when uh, you have sort of uh, the, the molecules go in, in, in uh, sort of you know flow through and, and, and so on um, so in in, <clears throat> in in order to have uh, a, a, the conduction uh, and your food evenly heating you need to you know switch off so that the water molecules heat up or polar molecules heat up to some extent and then uh, that uh, heat spreads uh, and so so typically uh, instead of you you know putting the microwave on and high and then you know stopping it and waiting and then putting it on again and doing that if you put it at low power what it does is it automatically cycles on and off so that that uh, you just have to do it for longer but it cycles on and off so that the, the microwaves can uh, go ahead or the, the heat can con conduct throughout and your food becomes heated evenly. Um, so a few other factors to consider. Uh, when you have a node, uh, that's where the food does not heat. Your, your, your microwaves, <clears throat> your polar molecules, water molecules will keep spinning when it, it's in these anti nodes where you know the because it cycles up and down and that's when the the, the molecules start spinning uh, but if they're at the nodes which is essentially near the walls uh, of the the microwave why is that so think about uh, if you take a rope and you tie it to a wall or a doorknob or something and you do that you can make a wa make a wave uh, so at the wall and where you're holding those points are not you know cycling up and down you know in, in terms of the positive or negative um, and so the, the near the walls the the food won't heat uh, and so uh, because you and there are also other nodes because uh, the the wavelength of a microwave is about 12.2 centimeters right uh, that's the 2450 megahertz uh, frequency that's what that corresponds to uh, so there are spots in your microwave uh, where there are hot spots where you'll have lots of these anti nodes or and then there will be nodes where you don't have heating and which is why you want to have that turntable right so uh, it this is a fun exercise and I, I encourage you to do that uh, you can use you know small cups of water four or five uh, take out the turntable uh, and then arrange those water cups and you can map sort of your your microwave to see which parts get heated most or not uh, I, although you know typically if you're doing it with the turntable um, uh, 
with the turntable then that's sort of more realistic setting so you can see what's what's going on right so you can use say marshmallows will which will melt or burn it's an or you know cheese you can get those uh you know those square uh, uh, cheese like things uh, you can put those uh, if, if you do that I would suggest putting it on a small piece of cardboard uh, not on a plate uh, unless you, you really like to clean up uh, you know sort of cheese from burnt cheese from from plate it's not fun um, other thing you can use are uh, papadums or uplums um, and here's an example uh, from uh, Leonard Edmonds site uh, and you can you know try this with different and these are from two different microwaves so you can see you know the the, the one uh, no, first one um, uh, which has uh, those circles that is very inefficient heating it's not distributed evenly uh, whereas the other one is slightly better you have you know a little bit more uh, heating th throughout those uplumps right uh, so you could test in fact uh, uh, how the microwave heats up so without rotation, you'll see these hot spots. Uh, you know, uh, actually a fun experiment. This is more on the physics side of things. If you can actually, uh, you know, put something on without the turntable and see the burn spots, uh, you should be able to, you know, see the distance between those two burn spots. And if you measure the distance carefully, uh, depending on what distance you get, uh, you can check. You know, how how is that accurate? Because again, if you if you know the uh, equation for for energy uh, and uh, uh, and then speed of light uh, and then energy is also related to wavelength then you can connect those two and then see what speed of light you get and that's a constant right in uh, in, in vacuum at least but uh, you should be able to see what's your uh, uh, accuracy uh, of measurement and so on so this, th those are some fun experiments you can try the other way uh, actually in in actual for practical purposes uh, microwaves uh, help distribute the heat more evenly is some of them have what's known as a mode chopper in which they mix up the microwaves a little bit more there's a fan blade or there's a blade which actually uh, reflects deflects the microwaves uh, so that it bounces around in your uh, the microwave chamber a little bit more uh, so that you have a little bit more even heat distribution uh, but uh, you know even you know whether you have these or not whether you uh, use uh, you know depending on your microwave uh, one thing you can definitely do is depend you know make sure you understand how it heats water and use that fact to uh, uh, heat your food a little bit more efficiently right uh, so if you're more sophisticated uh, you can of course map your microwave so again it's not just on on the on the bottom plate but even throughout the, the chamber where the microwaves bounce around so the, the the stuff sticking out here that's the sort of uh, waveguide the tube that the microwave comes out of uh, that's why that's there uh, so uh, uh, hopefully that gives you some insight into how microwaves work and how you can use it so for example if you're heating butter uh, butter is mostly fat but there's a lot of water so if you do it in high power the water is going to heat up and you know then some you can start to have explosions whereas if you want to just soften the butter uh, if you do it at lower power then the water will heat up and you'll have time for it to uh, you know spread to the other uh, fat molecules or uh, and fat within the you know block of butter that you're trying to soften or melt okay whereas if you put it on just high power and then you know suddenly some spots will be super hot and start boiling in fact and then that's where you start getting you know these big splutters and, and splashes and uh, messes that you have to clean up okay so with that I'm going to just uh, quickly uh, or briefly just touch about lip lipids and emulsifiers how are we doing on time okay um, uh, so I, I'll talk about this very briefly, uh, mainly because uh, you know oil and 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 everybody knows oils and and uh, water don't mix. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but just to tell you, typically when you think about fats in in food, uh, it's mo mostly we're talking about triglycerides, in which you have three molecules of fats, uh, which are connected to a molecule called uh, uh, connected to a molecule called um, sorry, it's here, uh, a glycerol, right? Uh, and so that's why you have a triglyceride and a glycerol is just like an alcohol instead of one carbon attached to that OH in like, like water you have three carbons which are all together right uh, and in fact uh, most dietary fats 
uh, are uh, you know uh, glycerols uh, or triglycerides I mean so uh, I think everybody uh, understands you know oil and water don't mix so here I have some you know uh, oil uh, and so the, that's another thing right you know oil floats on water so oil is on top water is at the bottom uh, this is colored because I put one drop of red food color just so that you'll be able to see the difference much more easily uh, and so here's another thing uh, so that's the other useful thing in terms of food and food molecules uh, and in terms of thinking about how things work things are either soluble in water or they're soluble in oil right there are very few things uh, that are soluble in both and, and we'll come to that in a bit but if you re just remember that things either mix with water or they mix with oil you just think about the kind of molecule and what that does and that will help you uh, you know do a lot of things in fact most interactions uh, not just in food molecules everywhere you come across are dependent on those kinds of forces between you know water or um, hydrophobic where they don't like to mix with water so uh, so this is oil and water as you can see if I try and mix it you'll get you know all kinds of droplets uh, and I you know you know adding these forces and I hopefully it's slightly visible you can see these tiny bubbles but what happens uh, when when I stop you know adding those forces the they don't like to mix so this is going to start separating back out as you can see um, that's separating oh uh, and uh, I was talking about the things that either like water or don't like water so I, this is red food color as you can see the food color is water soluble that's why only the water is colored and the oil was not colored uh, but this is a you know s quick simple way to see that it doesn't mix so if you do want to uh, uh, mix and the reason it it separates is because ultimately you want to reduce the the contact between the water and the oil and so when you have lots of droplets you have a lot lot of surface area in terms and therefore a lot of contact between the oil and the water and so to minimize that or to reduce that that's why it separates so that you have only one uh, one surface here uh, that looks like uh, where the, there's the, the separation between the oil and the water uh, if you want to keep the droplets uh, dispersed in in an emulsion then you need an emulsifier right and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, and so and and emulsions actually there's a whole range of foods that are emulsions if you think about milk it's an emulsion right it's uh, it's mostly water but there's a lot of proteins and uh, fat molecules completely dispersed throughout that uh, water and that's milk you butter uh, uh, mayonnaise uh, salad dressings and so on those are emulsions uh, and what does an emulsifier do so what an emulsifier does is uh, now an emulsifier has you know both a hydrophobic part which doesn't like uh, water and it has a hydrophilic part which likes water and so the hydrophilic part uh, which is here uh, uh, is now facing the water and then uh, the hydrophobic part which is these long red tails those are going to uh, stick into the oil and then surround it or dirt or whatever that's how detergents work right and so these will now stop those small droplets from combining uh, so how do you make an emulsion you must whisk uh, and then break it up into strong drop in, in break it up into droplets and I do have this is the same uh, you know uh, oil and water uh, well this just to make sure I, I pick up the right bottle I put a different color but this also has one drop uh, of dish soap right so let's see what happens uh, so as you can see I made this uh, here and I don't know if you can see this it's not separating out uh, as, as well as the other one right so essentially the the soap the dish soap uh, uh, coats those uh, oil molecules and then keeps it dispersed and, and stops it from separating right and so that's how that works so another uh, 
this tip for you uh, and then this becomes important because you know people tend to use a lot of soap and so on so if you have a little bit of emulsifier do you you know what if you put a lot more is more better actually that's not you don't want to use too much in fact the dish detergent and the liquid soaps that you get are actually quite diluted and that's because the manufacturers uh, know that people tend to use too much right um, and, and the reason for that is if you have too much once you use up the emulsifier that is going to coat the droplets and, and or the dirt or whatever you're trying to clean up, the rest of it will just clump together and, and form these micelles, right? And so you don't want to use too much. Uh, so how is that related to foods? Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, soap is not very tasty. Uh, so, but we can have, you know, use some other emulsifiers, other uh, detergent like molecules or surfactants, right? Uh, uh, one common one is uh, phosphatidylcholine or which is an, a component of lecithin, right? And so that has glycerol and instead of three chains, instead of being a triglyceride, it's two chains of fatty acids and it has a phosphate and a, and a, ni a nitrogen group and so that part uh, is charged, right? So that part which is, is circled is uh, water soluble and so uh, just like a soap molecule uh, it acts as an emulsifier and and so these are pretty fun to make foam so you, if you put soap uh, in in your sink or you can you can you get lots of froth or you know that, that's fun uh, but those are not very tasty if you use soap it's not going to be tasty so uh, but their foams are actually can be fun you can have foam in all kinds of different ways uh, you know th these are some random pictures I took uh, I was going to do uh, um, a demonstration with with lecithin but uh, I realized that you know, uh, it's just going to be me over here and I you can't taste it so that's no fun but um, you may, maybe you've tried Dalgona coffee I haven't tried it but it's the the I, I'm not going to try it uh, the Dalgona coffee I heard about it uh, recently but that's a, f a foam right but, but that's an air uh, and uh, air based foam and it's the same principle because the, the the part that doesn't like water will stick into air and that's why you stabilize air bubbles um, with uh, a thin layer of the water or the aqueous uh, whatever substance that is uh, and that's how you get a foam uh, so uh, I, I'm not going to do this but you can take any sort of aqueous liquid you know this is pomegranate juice or you know over the years I've done lots of you know different kinds of liquids and you can just add a little bit of lecithin uh, I don't think you'll, you're going, you're, you'll be able to see this. I have a picture later on on, on the slides. It's just a yellow powder and you can buy it in the store. Um, and you just need a tiny bit of lecithin and you can use a, one of those whippers and create a foam. Uh, and so, for example, at the, in the bottom here, you can see uh, there, there I, <clears throat> excuse me, you can make foam from soy sauce, for example. Uh, why do you want to do this? One is because it's fun. It's a, it, it's a different texture. Um, but you have to remember it's mostly air so unless you use a uh, strongly flavored liquid it's not going to have much of an impact um, but you can make these fun foams um, you know uh, I don't know how much of access you have to uh, sort of lecithin uh, but uh, in, in instead of uh, doing one of those foams I want to demonstrate and, and tell you a, one of my favorite recipes uh, which uses the lecithin that's already there in a chocolate bar, right? Uh, and over and this, uh, as far as I know, this uh, recipe for Chantilly or you know chocolate mousse, uh, Chantilly is Chantilly cream is when you mix uh, vanilla and sugar uh, with uh, whipped cr with cream and whip it, so you get a flavored you know cream. This is chocolate Chantilly, which uses so you'll get a whipped cream like or like a mousse, but it'll be made with chocolate instead of, uh, instead of milk cream, right? And this is a great recipe, uh, and it originated, uh, as far as I know, from Hervé Thies, uh, a French physical chemist. Um, uh, and he uses the fact that you have lecithin already uh, in a chocolate bar, right? So, <clears throat> so this is the basic, and I've done this, uh, uh, you know, in now over the years in, in maybe uh, close to a hundred flavors uh, and and the base recipe is uh, and I was going to do 
uh, some here as a demonstration. Now, all you need is 100 grams of, of chocolate. Um, and I've done this in, and this is one of the, the, the greatest recipes because uh, it's fail proof. And I've done it in 100 grams. I've done it also in a three kilogram uh, chocolate quantity, right? And so you can scale this, uh, you know, just in terms of these proportions. You need 100 grams of chocolate and slightly less than that of water, right? And instead of water, if you use a flavored liquid like say coffee or pomegranate juice, uh, th those work great. Uh, don't use some liquid which has a lot of sugar because the chocolate already has sugar. Uh, so then it becomes a little too sweet. Uh, so the way to do this is just uh, simply, you know, break up the chocolate. 100 grams uh, and uh, uh, I'll tell you why this works let, let me just come close to you and, and you can see oops and show you here so oops uh, do you see this the right way it might not be focused too well all right so I uh, I think I See if this works. Doctor, does can you do that in case you want people to? Ah, uh, yes. Actually, I have it here. Uh, so you can see that it contains uh, cocoa, cocoa mass, sugar, uh, and and also soy lecithin. Uh, and so I, uh, I realized this might not work too well live. So just as a backup, I, um, you know, quickly shot a video, and, and put it together. And so all you have to do is take this. This is 100 grams, and I'm doing it live over here, and that's kind of recorded. And you just, uh, let me just hang on. You take the chocolate, uh, and it, this has less than already, right? And so, so we're going to use that to make a foam. And that's the basic principle of this, right? Uh, and... Uh, we could do many things. Uh, in this case, I just use coffee. Uh, so I, I'm just going to melt this and then add the coffee to this. Let me put this here. And and so once you melt it and you add the flavored liquid, you just have to whisk vigorously, right? And initially, just make sure there's no lumps. You just a minute and a half in the microwave is fine, and you whisk vigorously. I've done this by hand. You can do it by hand. It'll take you about nine or ten minutes, right, maximum. Uh, but whisk as vigorously as you can. Uh, don't splatter too much. Uh, if you're using a hand mixer, that that's uh, uh, you know that makes it faster um, and 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 sort of less. Uh, exercise for your uh, arms. Uh, also, just make sure if you're using a hand mixer, um, you know, don't lift it out while the thing is still running because then you'll get it all over your walls um, unless you want to do that. Uh, so as you can see, after a little while, it'll start thickening, right? Uh, and you'll get like, you know, soft peaks. Uh, so once it starts thickening, uh, take it out because towards the end, it'll just, uh, you know, uh, harden quickly. Because remember, chocolate is a wonderful fat but it's solid at room temperature. So by cooling it down after you heat it up, you, you made the oil, you know, the chocolate fat into more liquid. Uh, and then uh, you mixed it with water and it has lecithin already. And so when you whisk it and whip it, that's what we did, right? We, we made that sort of emulsion. Uh, and then there's lecithin there and that stabilizes that emulsion. And then as the chocolate fat hardens, uh, you know, it, it, it thickens and you get this wonderful chocolate mousse. And I've made over the years uh, this in, in many, many, many flavors. Uh, you don't have to use a, a flavored liquid. You can just use water and use sort of a, a spice powder at the end. Uh, you know, for example, you can use sambar powder or some garam masala, or nutmeg, cinnamon. Uh, ginger works great. Coffee works great. Um, um, uh, a nice red wine works great. Chianti or something, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon works works great. Uh, what else? Uh, hot sauce does not work at all. Do not use hot sauce. Uh, mainly I meaning because when you do that, uh, don't ask me how I know. Uh, when you do that, vinegar 
uh, you that you get a blast of vinegar if you want to use chili powder that works fantastic or a curry powder uh, those work great uh, you just have to add a little bit and add it towards the uh, you know when you after you heat it up and you've just added the water uh, and then you can use that uh, and you can use all kinds of mixtures so you know with this you can make a chocolate mousse in any flavor uh, in 10 minutes or less uh, so um, I know I was invited by Haskick in, and most of you are in Bangalore uh, and so the, the the chocolate I used was uh, had either you know 75 percent uh, or this is 72 percent or 55 uh, percent uh, chocolate um, uh, you can use uh, I just looked through uh, Amul chocolates and they have a 55 percent dark and a 75 percent dark and that should work just as well and the reason uh, this and that's these two this which I picked up from the website uh, and the reason this is 75 or 55 percent is that's the amount of cocoa solids right uh, uh, the rest of it is cocoa fats and the other things this uh, chocolate bar including this one I showed you has is the emulsifiers which is less than in this case uh, it has the E322 and E476, which are just code names. Uh, those two are just code names for, again, lecithin, uh, which is phosphatidylcholine, as I mentioned. And the, okay, uh, that's the, the yellow powder I had here. That's what it looks like. Um, and the other one is, uh, uh, you know, po uh, polyglycerol, po uh, polyricosylinate, and that also these two molecules essentially are used for you know good flow properties and keeping the reason you have less than in a chocolate bar is to keep it smooth uh, and, and homogeneous and everything mixed in that's why it's there in in the chocolate to to have so that you have a smooth chocolate bar that's not grainy um, and, and, and but because that's there you can use it to to make this chocolate mousse okay and so I want to quickly wind up how am I doing on time okay yeah yeah we can go for a bit more we've got enough people hanging on to every word you say okay thank you that's kind all right so uh, i want to leave you with this final recipe um and and this uh, so hopefully you know with that you can go and try and make chocolate mousse in any flavor you like it'll take you 10 minutes as i said uh, oh, one just a quick warning uh, i'll just go back and show you oh okay uh, I'll show you the picture of the, the, the chocolate mousse at the end. Um, so I'll just uh, finish up with one final recipe and this uses uh, all the food molecule types we talked about uh, and it will uh, also use your knowledge of what happens in the microwave and that this is a, a simple recipe uh, for um, a, a microwave chocolate cake in a mug. Right, and so uh, you know you can make you know take any sort of mug, uh, you know any, any any coffee mug or something, um, and you can make chocolate, uh, sorry, a microwave cake in that. So why do you want to do that? So you know there are some times in life when nothing but chocolate cake will do, right? Um, maybe 2020. Uh, at such times, it's you know uh, especially at such times, it's better that you don't have a whole big giant chocolate cake in front of you right uh, so f for those times or for any time that you feel like chocolate cake um, or frankly I'm giving you this recipe but uh, it's not my recipe you can uh, I optimize this in terms of the amounts but you can do it in, also in any other flavor and you can easily tweak this and I hopefully you will experiment and, and try uh, things but it's very easy to make uh, all it does is has uh, it has and I've mixed the solids together and I usually keep some of this uh, uh, cake mix ready it's just flour and I, I use cake flour you can use all-purpose flour or maida or something like that um, flour uh, sugar and cocoa unsweetened cocoa right and and maybe a pinch of salt uh, to round out the flavor so I make the solids and I, and I usually keep a bunch of this sometimes I make ten times this uh, and keep it all together that's why I also never buy pancake mix because that's all it is pancake mix you also have a uh, little bit of baking uh, powder or, or baking soda um, 
uh, and that's uh, but we I don't have that here because we're going to do it in the microwave right uh, so in addition to the solids um, I just have the liquids and the liquids are uh, one egg uh, minus one tablespoon uh, the large eggs I get here about are about 45 grams or so and if I use a, a, an entire egg that gets a little too eggy um, I mean, of course, you could increase the solids. Uh, the only issue with that is then uh, it gets a little too big for the the coffee uh, mugs. I don't think there's anything as too much egg now. Well, in proportion. Uh, so yeah, so you can have you can use an entire egg. Uh, in you can use an entire egg. Uh, here, I, it's just one egg minus a, a tablespoon. Uh, that gives me about thirty-seven grams or so. This is the egg uh, oil. and uh, milk and I just you know mix it all together and and frankly you can just if, if you have these jars or something you can just put that in there mix it all together um, I'll just do it in here just make sure it's a little better mixed and so you'll get a nice cake batter. And it should take you maybe a minute max. And so you don't have to worry too much. Just make sure there's it's there's not too many like big lumps. There shouldn't be. And so there your your cake batter is ready. I'm gonna keep this here. And um, if you take and I have, oops. If you take a, a, a just a ordinary coffee mug. You put your cake batter in that and you just put this in the microwave and I'm just going to put it in the microwave that's to the side here. So that's a pretty standard cake batter. Pancake batter is the same except we're going to do this in the microwave. Now uh, I think you're, we've established that the microwave is, is very good at um, heating up water molecules, right? So what's going to happen? Uh, the water molecules over here are going to get heated up. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, do it here because it's going to be lo loud. So I'm just going to do it for about, this is a 700 watt microwave. Um, so actually, yeah, so you know what? Let me just do it here. In case you want to follow along, oh, I usually do it in my oops. I have to remember to take that out. Uh, so, if you're doing this at home, before you put the cake inside, make sure you take the light bulb out. And so, I'm going to put it here. And this should take me about uh, three minutes or three and a half minutes.